I would like to encourage you to keep your Bible open to this uh, reading of 3 John. We're going to spend all of our time this morning in this text, and we will just uh, study this book together today. What all of us know is that if we are attempting to be followers of Jesus, if we're trying to do our very best, that our lives and our reputations ought to reflect the love of Jesus, the affection of Jesus, and how he uh, dealt with other people. We know what the Scriptures say about uh, walking in the light as he is in the light. We know what the Scriptures say about letting our light shine before men so that they can see what we do but so that glory can be brought to uh, our Father in heaven. This book is the last of the one-chapter books uh, uh, that we will study in this particular series. Uh, this book is the shortest book in the Bible, uh, not by verses, but according to words. There are less than 200 words in uh, this particular letter, and uh, as we said, it was written by John. He begins in the very first uh, by telling us that he is, he is an elder, and it's written to a man who is a very a close friend of his. Now, we can kind of divide this book, and you can kind of outline it, based upon the people who are talked about in this book. There are four different uh, individuals who are talked about in this book. And I want us to just go through and, and read together and study uh, this book because it will help us in our goals to try to walk in the light and to try to let our light shine uh, before men. So we began by saying that it is the elder who is writing this book, and John by this time is aging in his life. Uh, he's probably a very old man by now. And as you know, John was the closest friend that Jesus ever had while Christ was on the earth. Jesus had some very, very close friends. He had some close friends, the we know of the 12 apostles who spent a lot of time with him. And then a group of close friends, he had a group of either, even closer friends. The three primary apostles, uh, James and John and Peter, who were very close to Jesus. They had some special uh, attention from Christ. There were times that they were with Christ that others were not. And so they were the closest friends. And we believe that John was the closest friend that Jesus had. And, and I bring that up because I think it's important for us to recognize that, that we ought to have friends in our life. Uh, I hope that in this church, if you are part of this church, I hope that you have some friends. I hope you're not here uh, by yourself and you never talk to anybody and you don't uh, hang around with anybody outside of this building, but I hope you have some friends and I hope you have some close friends. Maybe you're a part of a, a Bible class where you have some, you've developed some friendships in that Bible class. Maybe you are a part of a small group, like a, a care group, or, or some a Bible study group, a hubs group. I hope that you have some close friends, because building friendships will help us in our uh, spiritual growth, if they're the right kind of friends. They will help us in our walk with God, and they will help us in our commitment uh, to the church. And so we need uh, friends. This letter, uh, again, John is an older man by now. He has spent a lot of time with Christ while Christ was on the earth, and John calls himself an elder. Uh, that term elder, uh, the Greek term that is used here, is a term that refers to somebody who originally was an older man, but it conveyed the idea of, of respect and authenticity and integrity. So an elder needs to be a man who has courage. He needs to be a man of commitment. He needs to be a man of conviction. He needs to be an authentic individual. He needs to have respect from others around him. And he certainly should be a man of integrity. And so John writes this to this man by the name of Gaius. Gaius, uh, he calls Gaius four times. His beloved or his dear friend or his beloved brother, depending on the translation you're using. It expresses a heartfelt a love and appreciation for this man. And John told him how much he appreciated him. You know, we talked earlier about, um, in this series, about writing letters. We ought to tell people when we are, are thankful for them. When you have people who have made an impact on your life, when you have people who have influenced your life, I hope that you'll, you'll take the time to let them know how much you appreciate them, that you're thankful for them, that you appreciate what they've done for you in your walk with God how they've helped you when you've been down or maybe 
when you've gone through some kind of illness or a loss, uh, we ought to tell people that we are thankful for them. And when we think about this man, Gaius, there are some qualities in his life that I want us to notice. First of all, he was a man who had a spiritual mindset. Uh, he, he focused his life and his heart on spiritual things. Notice the words that John writes to him in verse 2. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health. So he's talking about, um, I hope that you are prosperous. Maybe he's talking about financially here. And he said, I hope you have good health. And then he adds on to that at the end of verse 2, just as your soul prospers. And so he's saying to this friend of his, look, I hope that you uh, do well financially, maybe in your job, and I hope that you have good health, and I hope that that is in comparison to your spiritual walk with God. He's saying to him, I want to thank you for being a spiritual-minded uh, person. And he knew that his spiritual life was in good shape. He knew that his spiritual life was in good health. And so when you know somebody who is um, maybe a young Christian, maybe somebody who hasn't been uh, close to Christ all of their life, and you see them doing well in their walk with God, we ought to tell them we're thankful that you are, you're growing in your walk with God, that you're doing uh, so well. So here's a man who is a spiritual-minded man. Here's a man who not only walked in a spiritual way, but he walked in truth. Notice in verse 3 and 4. I was very glad, he said to me. Uh, he, he had received word about his friend. And he said, I was very glad when um, brethren came and testified to your truth, that is how you are walking in truth. And then he said in verse 4, I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in in truth. So you live spiritually, and he says, um, I'm very glad to hear this report. I don't have any greater joy than to know that people that I've influenced are walking in truth. The word my children there may indicate that John was responsible for bringing a Gaius to Christ. So there's some thoughts along this line. If there are people that you've influenced uh, with your life, to walk with God, and maybe you brought them to Christ, you stay in touch with those people, you see how they're doing, you try to encourage them when you see them doing well. And so he said, I was glad to hear about this. And the greatest joy I have in my life is to know that people that I've influenced are walking in truth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that ought to be something that all of us could say. We ought to be able to say that the greatest joy in our life is to know people who we have influenced in our life who are walking in truth. And I would add that there is uh, no, nothing that is more sad in life than to know people who at one time were walking in truth who are no longer walking in truth. And John would probably have added that as well. And so he is walking spiritually, he is walking truthfully, and then number three, here, this individual is walking faithfully. Uh, look at verse five. You are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers and they have testified to your love before the church, you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. You see what John is saying here? He's saying, I'm thankful that you're faithful to God. I'm thankful that, that you are doing good for other people. Uh, you are walking faithfully. Uh, you, are, uh, you are accomplishing some good things among the brethren. And so what are you doing in your walk with God right now among the brethren? Is there anything that you are doing to encourage other Christians? Is there anything that you are doing to help other Christians in their walk with God? And so he was thankful that he was walking faithfully. And then uh, he was thankful uh, that he was serving others. And so notice verse uh, 7 and 8. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. So here is an individual who helped other people in the proclamation of the gospel, in the teaching of the gospel. I want to thank you for your work in helping make sure that we are doing our part to help the gospel preach, be preached in many places. Uh, I was talking to a couple of folks last Sunday at the uh, fellowship meal. Um, uh, the Combs boys, two of them, Everett, 
uh, and his dad are going on a mission trip to Bolivia. They're going to be spending some time there, and Everett's going to be teaching in a vacation Bible school there. Isn't that wonderful that here's a young man, a teenage young man, who is going to be preaching the gospel in another country. And, and there are others who are going on mission trips, who have recently uh, been in other countries. And so thank you for, for your participation, for your fellowship, for your uh, proclamation of the gospel. And so here, here's a good man that we can emulate in our life. A man who, who walked uh, according to truth, a man who, who served God and who served others, and a man who was loyal uh, to the kingdom of God. And so there, there's a great example. The second person that's mentioned in this book is a man who, who was everything that Gaius was not. And this man's name is Diotrephes. And when you think about the word Diotrephes, it even, it even kind of sounds bad. I've never met anybody named Diotrephes in my life. I've uh, never heard anybody say, I think I'm going to name my son Diotrephes. Um, number one, because it's probably hard to say, uh, but uh, who wants to be named Diotrephes? Well, well let's look at, at his life. There are um, a couple of things about him, beginning in verse 9. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. So just as Gaius was walking in the truth, and he loved the truth, here's a man who didn't want to have anything to do with the truth. He didn't want to listen to what John the elder, um, who perhaps was involved in teaching him, he didn't want to hear what he had to say. And this man seemed to have an agenda in his life. Um, it seemed to be driven by pride. John wrote a letter uh, that now is lost to us, according to verse 9. It was probably a letter of commendation for uh, missionaries. Uh, its reception met a problem in the person of Diotrephes. And Diotrephes is not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. And John says of him that he loved to have first place among them. In my mind, I have this picture that John wrote a letter to the church about some missionaries and maybe Diotrephes was, um, uh, had been a part of that group, and he got angry at John because his name wasn't mentioned first and most. He, he wanted to be first. He wanted to be first on the list. He wanted to have his name called out. He wanted everybody to know who he was. Here is a man who had a, a prideful ambition about him. And just as there are things about the life of Gaius that we would want to emulate, there are things about diatrophies that we would not want to emulate. Uh, also, he seems to be, be arrogant. Notice the way John describes him at the end of this verse. He does not accept what we say. It's like uh, you can't teach him anything. Uh, he, he doesn't want to, to learn anything. Um, John did not fear any kind of confrontation if he needed to have confrontation. But uh, here is a man he was seemingly arrogant, and um, uh, he, uh, he seemed to, to have accusations that he was making against others. And so here's a man that we would not want to follow. We don't want to be like diatrophies. We don't want to have any kind of personal pride. We don't want to have selfish ambition. Uh, we don't want to ignore the teachings of the Word of God, and, and we don't want to be involved in the wrong kind of activity. Notice verse 10. For this reason I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. So not only would he refuse to listen, but he made false accusations. And he wasn't satisfied with this. Not only did he make false accusations about others, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Well, what's the lesson here? Well, the lesson is um, don't be this kind of person in the kingdom of God. Don't be a person who is always um, uh, negative, who is always making accusations about others, who's speaking unkindly to others. It, it, it still amazes me in my life when I hear somebody who, um, who has been ugly to some when I hear about one Christian who's been ugly to another Christian, 
When I hear somebody who, about somebody who doesn't get their way or something doesn't go the way they like it and they take it out on another Christian and they speak ugly words and unkind words and, and they seem to be very angry and very hateful, and sometimes people say, well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, the bottom line is, and the truth is, it doesn't matter what they did to you. No child of God, and, and please listen to me, church, no child of God should ever, ever, ever speak to another child of God in an unkind, ugly, mean-spirited way. It just shouldn't happen. And, and we, we need to... We need to stop doing that. If, you, um, if you're angry with somebody, if you're upset because you didn't get your way, don't be ugly about it. If you need to have a, a conversation, that's okay. But don't be ugly. Don't, don't use um, unjust accusations and what John called wicked words. Well, there's a third individual mentioned in this book, and here's a man by the name of Demetrius. And Demetrius is a man who, who had a good name. Demetrius is a good, uh, faithful child of God. And, and there are a couple of thoughts about Demetrius. He, he, he uh, lived a godly example. Look at verse 12. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. You know, what does that mean? Well, that means everybody spoke well of Demetrius. Uh, he uh, had a good name. People thought about this brother in Christ. And they were thankful for him. And not only did people speak well of him, but he had a good testimony based upon the fact that he lived according to the word of God. And he was a, a godly example. From the truth itself, we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. And so here is an individual who, who lived a godly example. Verse 11, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God, and the one who does evil has not seen God. You know what John is saying there? He's saying if you're like this character by the name of Diotrephes, and if you're unkind to other Christians, and, and you speak ugly, wicked words to other Christians, then you, he says, that cannot be of God. And so you be sure that when you say something that is unkind and unchristian, to a brother or sister in Christ, that did not come from God. And if you've been the recipient of that, you need to know that did not come from God. That God is not pleased with that. And there are times that, um, that we just need to let those things go. And so he says, don't imitate that. If you see it in others, don't imitate it. Um, you know, if, if we were talking to our children and our grandchildren, and if we saw somebody speaking to somebody else in an ugly, unkind way, we would say to our children, grandchildren, don't do that. Don't, don't be like that. Some of us are that way. And he says, that is not from God. Because the one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. And so here's a man who, who lived a godly example, and he, uh, he had a good name. And so that's the kind of individual we want to follow. And then the last part of this great book, uh, he mentions his own life, John himself. Notice the words in verse 13 and 14. I had many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you, the friends greet you, greet the friends by name. Throughout this letter, John has given to us some positive examples and some negative examples. And he's portrayed, he's painted a portrait of good, godly leadership. And he's shown us the balance of belief and behavior. And he's painted a picture of ungodly leadership. And the wrong kind of leadership and the wrong kind of people. And as he brings the letter to a close, he reveals his own heart. You can see in the words that he writes his love and compassion for these people. He has a desire to be present with them. What he says is, there's a lot of other things I need to say to you. There's a lot more I want to say. I remember when, 
when I was, uh, when I first started preaching up in North Alabama, and um, I was 21 years old, and I thought there were times I don't have any idea what I'm going to preach next Sunday. And, and I, I struggled sometimes with finding what to preach. And now I think sometimes there's not enough time to get it all said. And as you know, sometimes I try to say probably longer than I should. Um, we may spend three years in Luke and three years in Genesis, um, but that's okay too. Uh, John says, there's a lot more I want to say to you, but I don't want to write it down. I want to come and be with you. John loved these people. He loved, if this was a church that was meeting in the home of Gaius, he loved this church. And he said, I want to be with you. He wanted to, to be with um, Gaius and uh, Demetrius. He probably wanted to confront Diotrephes face to face. Um, pen and ink are good, but that's not enough. He wanted to see them. He wanted to look into their face. And if we are children of God, I think the lesson for us here is that, that we ought to long to be together. We ought to, to look forward to the times that we're together. We need to want to spend time with one another. We need to enjoy it when we're together. We need to love to visit with one another and talk to each other and talk about life and, and talk about family and talk about things that, that matter to us. That's one of the reasons I think it's important for us to, to come to the assembly times, whether it's Sunday night at 6 o'clock or Wednesday night at 7, because we ought to long to see each other, to want to be with each other. Here's a man who loved to be in the presence of his fellow believers. And then the last thing is that he desired peace for his uh, fellow believers. John hoped to see them soon. He could hardly wait uh, to see them. He wanted to sit down face to face with them, to, to spend personal time with them. A letter wasn't enough, but he closed with an expression of peace. Peace be to you, he said. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. And so he wanted them to have peace in their life. And our prayer for one another should be that we want peace for each other. Um, oh, how much we long for peace in our world, in our country. We should long for peace in our families. We should long for peace for the church. I'm thankful that to a very, very large degree, this church is at peace with one another. And we ought to long for that. And we ought to hope that that will be even better as the years go by, that we can be at peace with one another. And um, if you're away, I hope you think about the people who are here as people who are friends. I hope you can say what John said. The friends I have here greet the friends that are there. I hope we can be friends with one another and that we can live at peace with one another. And when we can develop these characteristics of men like Gaius and Demetrius and John, and when we can get out of our heart and out of our life and out of our mind characteristics like this man, Diotrephes, uh, we will live at peace with one another and we will be friends with one another. And when we do that, then we truly will walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. Then we will let our light shine before men so that they can see what we're doing, but so that they can glorify our Father who is in heaven. So I want to close today by asking you in your own walk with God, how are you doing? Number one, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you a follower of his? Have you given your life to him? Have you expressed your faith and your belief that he is the son of God by confessing that before um, people that you know and love? Have you been immersed for the forgiveness of your sins? Are you walking to the very best of your ability in the light? Are you a Christian? If, if somebody asked somebody close to you today and they said, does this person remind you more of somebody like John or somebody like Diotrephes? What people say about you? If people think about you, that you talk to others and treat others like Diotrephes did, I want to encourage you to change your life today. Maybe you don't need to make a public response, 
but maybe it's private and you need to talk with God and maybe there's some individuals that you need to, you need to go to them and say, I'm sorry, I, I treated you like diatrophies would have. We need to be people who love one another, who are at peace with one another, who are friends with one another, and who are doing everything that we can to live lives that glorify God. If you have any need in your life, if there's any way that we can be of help to you, if we can pray for you, we can help you in any way, we invite you to come while we stand together and while we sing this song.